Well, if you have your Bibles, we're not going to prolong. We're just going to just hop right in because I got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be reading verses 32 and following through verse 40. Next week, we'll pick up on chapter 12, verse 1. I'll just deal with verse 1 next week. That's all the time we'll have next week. I've already been working on it. Uh, but this is a prelude to that that we find in this text. And hopefully you keep in mind what has already been read because we read through the chapter with a purpose in mind. Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 32, reads as follows. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions. Verse 34 said, they quench the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, became vigilant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised from, to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens, caves of the earth. All of these, having tamed a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Father, we just thank you so much. We had offered to you our offering of praise, our offering of song, our offering of giving. Now we pray, Father, that you will speak to us clearly, concisely, bring to remembrance in the mind of the speaker all that you have helped him to understand from examining the text and having been examined by the text. We pray that you illuminate the minds of the hearers, give them the ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say. And may we be transformed by what we hear because of who you are. We can be what you've called us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Let every heart say, Amen. You may be seated. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, we've titled this message, The Examples of Courage. We've been talking about courage for stressful times. And I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it doesn't take much for us to know that we are living in stressful times. Inflation, gasoline prices, wars, rumors of wars, politicians, Trumpism, Bidenism, blackism, whiteism, Hispanicism, male, female isms, and isms that aren't really even isms. Very confusing time. Time of fake news. Time of false information. Times of manipulation by news media personnel and politicians. And that would be bad enough, but we're living in confusing time, not only in the world, but there's confusion in the household of God. There's confusion among God's people about what truth is and where we should be standing and what we should be about and how we should represent God in a lost and fallen world, what the agenda of the church is and what the agenda of the Christian home is and even what the agenda of the gospel is. Confusing times, stressful times. But all of this is a part of God's bigger plan. 
All of this is either being allowed or caused by him because as we learned in our last series, celebrating God our Savior, he is the majestic Father. He is holy, he is righteous, he is all-knowing, he is all-powerful, he's everywhere present, even in the midst of stressful times. And if we don't keep our eyes focused on the right prize, if we don't keep our minds set in the right place, then we will be as topsy-turvy as to and fro, blown about why every wind of false doctrine that comes along, we will not have a good anchor and a good foundation. I asked a question in Sunday school and I asked it on purpose because I want to connect the Sunday school to the message. One of the reasons we're so confused is we keep changing the standards. We keep redefining words and redefining things. And even in the church, we want to say that we can improve on God. I'm here to tell you, you can't improve on God. He's the perfect God. He's the God that is the same in the present as he was in the past, as he will be in the future. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever he doesn't need any updating. He doesn't need to be rebooted. He doesn't need to be edited. To be a Christian means that you have, by faith, believed in God's provision of salvation that is found in Jesus Christ alone. You are not counting on, you are not banking on, you are not trusting, you are not putting your weight on anything else other than what Jesus and Jesus alone has done to save you, to deliver you, to make you right with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That faith Paul says in Romans, saves a man or a woman. See, it's not faith in faith. It's faith in the right object of your faith. And Christ is to be the object of your faith. And if Christ is the object of your faith, you are saved based on him and him alone. That's the head side of the coin. But there's a tail side of the coin. If you have been saved by faith, which Paul writes about in Romans, James says, show me the evidence. Show me the proof. Show me the stuff in how you live that gives evidence that you have saving faith because saving faith produces living faith. That's why he says in this text we're going to see in chapter 10, the just, the righteous, the justified shall live by faith. Because it's one thing to be saved by faith. It's another thing to take that faith and live it out. And that's what we see here in Hebrews chapter 11. God provides, he says in chapter 12, a great cloud of witnesses. Now, he doesn't mean we got people sitting up in heaven watching us. What he's talking about, there are examples who have lived this stuff out, who have demonstrated what it is by faith to do this or to believe this or to act on this. So therefore, we have a great cloud of witnesses who have already demonstrated, who have already illustrated what it is to live out that faith that you have in God. Uh, nobody's praying with me this morning. Because we don't want witnesses. We don't want people who have already done it, because if there's people who have already done it, I don't have any excuse for doing it or not doing it. 
And so we want to disqualify them. We want to bring up all the things they did wrong and say, well, since they did stuff wrong, I can excuse my doing wrong. But as my mother used to say when we were growing up, if everybody jump off a bridge, you jump in two. Just because everybody else did it don't mean we should be doing it. Because you're going to find out next week and the week after that, you are to fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. Not faulty examples. Now, we need to be aware of the examples because that's why Hebrews chapter 11 is in the book. But don't use the sinfulness of the faulty examples to rationalize you're not living by faith. Because while they may have all fallen or got off track, God testifies in the inspired word, these are examples of faith. Is anybody with me this morning? You see, your children, my children, whether they are adults or whether they are teenagers or whether they are toddlers, live in a world of people who are like this illustration. Listen to this. A university professor once boasted, one of my callings in life is to shatter the faith of naive fundamentalists. As they come to my class, just give me a room of young, naive evangelicals and let me at them. You can just watch them drop like flies hit with raid. When I challenge their faith in a deliberate, consistent manner. Here's the question. Are you ready for the question? Do you have faith that endures in spite of the attacks that come from the non-believers? Do you have faith that endures in spite of the situations and circumstances in life that appear to be negative, do you have faith that endures and that you continue to live in no matter the situation, the circumstances, or problems? Saving faith produces living faith. And if you don't have saving faith on this side, matched by living faith on this side, then you don't have authentic Christianity. Uh-oh. I think I lost some of y'all right about there. Any more than you would have a coin that is of any value and any use. If all it had is, is head on one side and nothing on the other side. Or something other than tails on the other side. In order to have a coin that's of value, that can spin, and is not counterfeit, it must meet the standard of the one who established the standard. Or it has no value. The problem in the modern day church is that we have so many people who want to profess saving faith and then live something different who don't live by faith, which is the same faith that you said you got saved by. And the problem in our modern day culture, the reason why racism has not been solved in the church in 400 years and the one another's are not being lived out is we got a lot of people saying one thing and living some other way. If God saved you, which is the only way you can be saved, you mean God can't produce what he meant salvation to produce in you? Now, we all know that we can reject, we can grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. We're commanded not to do those things, but you're commanded not to do them because there's a potential to do them. But first, John wants to say, when you know that you off. You're supposed to confess that you are, not keep being off. Not keep going the wrong way. But some Christians are like 
a lot like men. Too prideful to admit they don't know where they're going. So they keep going the wrong way, no matter how much the Holy Spirit or their wife and their children are trying to tell them, you're going the wrong way. I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. Now, he knows he don't know what he's doing. Can I get a witness, ladies? Help me out on this. Men ain't with me no more. They left me. You telling them, hey, the map says, the GPS is talking to you, saying you missed the exit. I know what I'm doing. He refuses to get off at the next exit. Cross over the inner pass. Get back on the entrance ramp and get to the right way. And I've found as a pastor, when life hits people, when circumstances get all crazy, when sin starts to dominate people's life, they're like men. They refuse to admit they're going the wrong way. Now, it's not that we can never miss our destination. But when you keep going the wrong way, when you know you missed your destination, you are not illustrating living faith. Following in the footsteps of the faithful, which we have here in Hebrews chapter 11, with courage. It it takes courage to live the Christian life. Let me show you this in Hebrews chapter 10. Turn to verse 35 in Hebrews chapter 10 as we build our case and try to move to this introduction as quickly as possible. Hebrews 10, 35 through 39. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence. That word confidence can also be translated courage. So this text, whether you understand or not, is about courage. Confidence. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence or courage, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him, God says. See, the problem is in the book of Hebrews is that they were supposed to be looking for the coming of the Messiah. And you all know what happened in the Gospels. They rejected him. They, the Jews are still really waiting for the Messiah. And the book of Hebrews is written to them to say that Christ is superior to all of the Old Testament ceremonies and dietary laws and symbols. And now that you have the reality who is Christ, that the symbols and ceremonies were pointing to, leave those things and come to Christ. But wouldn't you know it? They wanted to hang on to the old. They wanted to hang on to the history. They wanted to hang on to what they wanted to hang on to and not leave it and come to Christ. And it is a very dangerous thing to sit and hear the word of God preach and proclaim and the Holy Spirit illuminate that that's the truth and you draw back from it. And there are people who sit in services Sunday after Sunday and hear the word of God and they read the word of God maybe during the week and they draw back from it. They don't do it. They don't move forward on it. They don't live it. And the text says that God is not pleased with those kind of people. You're in danger as you will see next week of going backwards rather than going forward. Becoming stagnant. And when you become stagnant, you're not moving. And if you're not moving, you're going backwards. Because Christianity is like a marching army. It's an advancement forward. It's not a retreat backwards. But the question that many of us would ask, 
And it's a good question. Has anybody really done this? Has anyone really lived by faith? And so God in his wisdom writes a whole chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, giving you example after example after example after example. And we still try to come up with excuses. Hebrews shows that because the old covenant has been fulfilled in the new covenant, the new covenant is actually better than the old covenant. We have a better covenant in Christ than they had in the Old Testament symbols and dietary laws and ceremonial laws. We got something better, and we act worse. The new covenant was made superior by the ministry of Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews wanted to exalt Jesus Christ. He wants to move believers from a stagnant state to growth and maturity in their relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ. Are you stagnant this morning? Has your get up and go for Jesus got up and went? Or are you just drifting along, going wherever the current of this world takes you? And not letting the Spirit of God and the Word of God lead you to the promised land found in Jesus Christ. Are you saying, I believe? And there's no evidence of what you say you believe. You remember before I went on vacation, I told you knowing the facts is not enough. And I gave you the illustration of the cigarette industry. I don't smoke, and I hope you don't smoke. But you know people who do. You've seen the commercials. On the side of the package, they say, cigarettes can be dangerous for your health. And they tell you what health risks you might be at. And it's verified by the surgeons general. Now, it's not that people don't know that cigarettes are not good. The facts are right there. But then you got people, doctors, who treat people for lung cancer, who smoke cigarettes, who have read the Surgeon's General, who are treating people who are dealing with infirmities that come from smoking, who will go right outside into their office and smoke too. How do you do that when you say you know the facts? That cigarettes are hazardous to your health. Because knowing the facts won't change you. It's believing the facts, responding based on the facts, and living something different in light of the facts. It's possible to be in a church all your life, heard all this good gospel stuff, been taught the Bible well, and you never apply a thing that you hear. Now, y'all can be confused about where people are. I'm not confused. Why am I not confused? Because the Bible's not confused. If you are saved by faith, where is the habitual consistent, because none of us do it perfectly, evidence that you are living by faith. Well, I went to church. These pews go to church every Sunday. They ain't living by faith. These microphone stands are here every Sunday. They're not living by faith. You know why they're not living by faith? Because they dead. Are we going to say they have like because they in church? Because that's what we do with people. No, this testimony we find in this text doesn't look like that. There are four examples of courageous faith that lead to maturity in the faith that I want to share with you. Let me give them to you and then we'll come back. You guys know the routine. 
The first one is the mixed vehicles of courageous faith, verse 32. The mixed vehicles of courageous faith. Secondly, there's the multiplied victories of courageous faith. The multiplied victories, verse 33 to 35. Then there's the messy visuals of courageous faith, verse 36 to 38. And finally, fourthly, we have the multicolor or multi-ethnic vitality of courageous faith, verse 39 to 40. Let's, let's deal with these. I don't want to take long. I said I was going to try to learn to preach a little bit shorter, so I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working my way there. I'm working my way there. The mixed vehicles of courageous faith. Look at verse 32 with me of Hebrews chapter 11. It, it won't take us long with this one. And what more should I say? I, I like this. I could spend a lot of time on these people, but even the writer of Hebrews says, what more can I say? I really didn't say it at all. If you go back through verses 1 through 31, there's enough evidence. There's really nothing more I can say. I could talk about some other people. I can give you some other examples, but this really should be enough. And what I like about this list, if you took the time like I took to study each one of these individuals, they're not perfect people. Look at the list. You got Abraham on the list. Y'all know about Abraham, right? I don't have enough time to go through all of what Abraham messed up on. How about Rahab? A prostitute is on the list. How about David? Y'all, he on the list. This don't sound like people who belong in the great cloud of witnesses. But see, it's not about perfect people. It's about people who are being perfected. Because of their faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, and who are giving evidence that they have consistently, habitually trusted in God. In my Jewish translation of uh, uh, the English translation of the Jewish Bible, the word they use is by trusting. Where you see by faith in verse 17 and other verses, in, in the Jewish translation, my English translation of Jewish Bible, it says by trusting Abraham did. So to have faith is to trust. Do you really trust God? Do you really trust Jesus? And we live in a world where people struggle with trust. Tell the truth, shame the devil. We are so used to people conniving and lying and manipulating the truth, we don't know who to trust. And then you bring that to Jesus. Look at the text. By faith, verse 17, Abraham, when he was tested. Wait a minute, Pastor. If I've placed my faith in Jesus, why do I got to have a test? Let me tell you why you need a test. Because you're supposed to know the information. And we don't know as teachers and professors if you know the information unless we give you a test. Yeah, but pastor, God knows everything. You don't know. You're saying you believe. You've read the side of the cigarette package. But the test is, do you not smoke? You want to impress people by how you are able to read. That you can even recite what's on the side of the package while you're puffing on a cigarette. And we want to say we believe in Jesus, that we have put our full trust in Jesus, but then when life tests us, when God tests us, when situations test us, when the professor tries to disqualify our belief and our faith, and he sprays rain on us, we die. Because we really don't trust. It was by faith, by trusting, 
the promises and the provisions and the presence of God that Joshua, as we went through Joshua chapter 1 that led up to this text, did what they did in taking the land. But so did everybody else on the list in chapter 11. God saved Rahab because Rahab, by faith, hid God's men so they would not be killed because he trusted in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and not the gods of her land. How do we know that? We know it by what she did, not what she said. Here's what we do in our Bible study. How could God bless a lie? Because here's something we don't understand. I'll give this one to you for free. It's not even in my notes, but I'll give it to you for free. We don't understand, just like in Matthew chapter 4, there are other scriptures that trump some other scriptures. They were going to murder God's men. They were going to kill them. And God, the God of Israel, is not for shedding innocent blood. Y'all ain't getting this. Y'all ain't getting this. I can see it in your face. So Rahab, who didn't even know the God of Israel, by faith, protected the men of God. And God blessed her because she protected God's men from being murdered. Y'all get trippy on the lie. Because this commandment superseded this commandment. Those are, but on the other hand, that we don't always understand. Because Satan came to Jesus with some scripture. But Jesus says, but the scriptures also say this. And this trumps what you said, Satan, even though what you said came out the Bible. That's why you got to know your Bible backwards and forward. Up and down. Because Satan has no problem losing scripture to try to get you out of the will of God because he knows you don't know what you should know. But he forgot he wasn't dealing with Adam and Eve, he's dealing with Jesus. Who is the scripture embodied in human flesh. You can't trick him like you tricked Adam and Eve in the garden. And Satan in our world is tricking us because we don't know what we're supposed to know. We know the TV God better than we know the scriptures. You know what's going on on your story and what's going on in the life of all them fake characters, then you know the ones of the scriptures. I'm sorry, I dabbled into areas y'all don't want me to dabble into. Each individual, the writer of Hebrews mentions under the divine inspiration of God was less than perfect, just like every believer. But God approved of them because they were faithful to him. They had a life of consistent faithfulness to God even when they messed up. I got good news for you this morning. Come close. You're going to mess up. You're going to disobey God. But the proof of your living faith is that when you mess up, when you disobey God, when you don't keep his commandments, you are to confess your sins because then he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. A Christian who is living by faith is not one who lives perfectly, but when they are imperfect, confess that they are imperfect, run to Jesus because their trust is in Jesus and know they will be forgiven because the blood has covered all their sins. So don't come to me telling me I don't want to come to church because I, I, I don't think I'm, I'm perfect enough yet. You never will be. The great thing about the Christian faith, God says, come as you are. I'll clean you up and fix you up so you don't stay as you are. Well, I'm waiting to get myself together. You're going to be waiting forever. Because nobody in here has got it together. Y'all just need to stop faking. But those who are saved by faith, 
must demonstrate they are living by faith. And these people do some extraordinary things because they trust God. And because they trust God, God does some extraordinary things on their behalf. Read the list when you get home. I know y'all read it earlier, but now you have a whole different view about reading the list, right? This leads us to our second point, the multiplied victories of courageous faith. You know, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, you ought to memorize. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct. That word direct in the Hebrew means make your way smooth or straight. Why you got a bumpy ride walk all the time? Does God not all at some time make your path smooth and straight? But it only gets smooth and straight when you trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you're not leaning to your own understanding. And in all your ways are acknowledging him. It's about trust. Have you put your full weight of the totality of your life and eternity on Jesus Christ alone? Or are you trying to find hope in other things? Other people? Other feelings? Other ideologies? Other gods? Look at this, the multiplied victories in verse 33 to 35. He lists the names in verse 32, who through faith subdue kingdoms. Work righteousness, obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword. Out of the weakness were made strong, became vigilant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. All of these are testimonies of these people on the list of what they did by faith in God. Question. I know y'all don't like it when I ask questions. But this is the practical application. What is it about your trust in Christ as you live out your Christian faith that people can point to and say, God is doing great things through them? God is doing miraculous things through them. We got some miraculous stuff going on here. Because God is doing things on their behalf because they trust him. And he delivers them from some situations. He overthrows some enemies and some armies. We saw that with Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, did we not? We saw that with Moses as God opened up the Red Sea and allowed his people to walk across on dry land where everybody had to know that had to be the God of Israel. It couldn't because of the weather man on channel 132. What is it about your living for Christ that people have to say, God did that because of their trust in God, because of their trust in Jesus Christ? Listen, if all you got is salvation, as important as that is, and you don't have anything that is living, something wrong with you. Your salvation is good for getting you into relationship with God. But living faith says I have fellowship with God. The relationship can never be lost. But people need to see more than your relationship because I can't crawl up inside of you and really test whether you got relationship or not. But I can see the demonstration of God working in your life that gives evidence that you have fellowship because you're living by faith. See, these are things you can see that God was doing for his people 
and for those who were trusting him. What is it about my life and your life that people cannot deny that God is doing? He woke you up this morning. A lot of sinners got up this morning, so what else you got? He started you on your way in your right mind. A lot of sinners started out their house in the right mind. What else you got? He blessed me with stuff. A lot of sinners are blessed with stuff. What else you got? What is it that is so supernatural that even the sinner has to say, that's God? I go to church. A lot of sinners go to church. What else you got? A lot of sinners stay home. A lot of sinners go to church. What else you got? Just read the list when you get home. It, I'm, I'm, I'm like, like the writer of Hebrew. Time will not allow me to really break this down for you. But if you read it, you really don't need much breaking down. They experience victories against foes that they should not experience victory against. You and I should be experiencing victory against foes. And we talked about what the foes are. Satan, self, sin, and this world system. Are we experiencing victories over those enemies? That it's miraculous. That even the sinner has to say, that's God. Think about it. Remember when God opened up the Red Sea? And the land was dry. And the sinner said, look at God's people. We can do that too. Did you know what happened to the people who looked at what God did with his people and tried to imitate? Oh, y'all ain't getting it. Pharaoh and his army tried to, the day went across, we can go across. What happened to him? The Bible says, and Pharaoh and his army drowned in the sea. What is it that God is doing in your life that when sinners try to imitate it, they drown? Because it happened for you because of your faith in God and Christ. And we're thanking God for a lot of stuff that sinners can thank him for. We call that in theological terms, common grace. What is the specific grace that you're experiencing in your life that the sinner never gets to experience? So all this wealth, health, and prosperity, all this word of faith stuff is really people just attaining what any sinner can attain. But when God supernaturally moves against foes that you don't have the power to overcome, but you overthrow them anyway because God is the one as Y'all ain't praying with me. He multiplies the victory. They subdue kingdoms. They, and Moses conquers the Amorites and the Bashans. They stop the mouths of lions. Y'all remember Daniel and the lions then? Now, as I thought about this, I thought about the fact that Many of us thank God for common grace stuff because there's no supernatural specific grace stuff happening in our lives. See, common grace doesn't get you delivered from lions. You need something supernatural to happen. When lions have been prepared to be hungry, starved so they would be hungry, and at the first sign of some meat they're going to eat, and they drop you in there and they don't eat? That ain't common. That's supernatural. Now, why was Daniel put in the lion's den? You can go read Daniel chapter 6 to get the full story, but here it is. Because he would not bow to the will of the government. You see, you see, see, there were some guys who served with Daniel in the government. And they didn't like Daniel because the king really showed favor to Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, 
and Abednego, and they were jealous. They tried to get Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego with fire. God delivered them out of fiery furnace. Well, he didn't deliver them out of the furnace, just joined them in the furnace. They had a party in the furnace, hung out in the furnace and missed the fire, which is not common, so it must be supernatural, because if you drop you in the furnace, and they turn the furnace up sometimes higher than the normal heat, and you sit in there partying, worshiping, and don't burn up, even unsaved people got to recognize that ain't normal. That didn't work. Daniel wasn't around. He might have been out of town. I don't know. But they said, well, we got to get Daniel. How are we going to get Daniel? Well, we've tried several times to get him to compromise with the world and with our standard on his God. He wouldn't do that. If we're going to get him, we got to trick the king, manipulate the king into making a law that we know Daniel won't violate if he got to choose between the law and the God. Y'all think y'all living in strange times. There's nothing new under the sun. So we know one thing that Daniel does, he goes home and prays every day, three times a day, with his windows open. So let's tell the king and manipulate the king into making a law that we can only pray to the king's God. Because we know Daniel. Now, is it... Isn't it strange they knew how to get that brother? He's not going to compromise with the world. We're not going to trick him into falling for anything worldly. We got to get him based on what we know that he's committed to. So the king falls to the trap. He makes a law. What does Daniel go home? He goes home and throws up in the window, and he does what he does normally every day, the Bible says. And they come and say, aha, gotcha. Now, the king has made a law. He got, he got to go with the law because these guys are looking at him. Now, he doesn't really want to do it, but he got to do what the law says. So they drop him in the lion's den. How'd that go? King Nebi comes and looks in the lion den, and Daniel's sleeping on the lions. Chilling, maxing and relaxing, using the lions like a recliner. If he had had a television, he would have turned it on, he'd been sitting back, chilling. How does that happen? Because God Daniel demonstrates that his faith and his trust is in God and it doesn't matter what man or the world system or Satan tries to tell him to do. And because he demonstrates living faith, God rescues him supernaturally in the lion's den. What is it about us that God is doing that would put us in the hall of fame of the great crowd of witnesses? Or are you just trying to make it? Barely getting by. And then we wonder why unsafe folk don't come to God because they don't see anything different with us than it's going on with them. They escaped the edge of the sword and, and, and received their dead raised from life again. This is the widow of Seraphat and the Shulamite woman in verse 35 who received back their dead resurrected. You find that in 1 Kings 17, 8 through 24, and 2 Kings 4, 8 to 37. But that's the positive stuff. Look at verse 35. There's some negative things. See, it, it's easy to believe God when you know you're going to get positive results. It's easy to live by faith when you know the outcome is going to be supernatural. But I love what the writer of Hebrew does here in verse 35. He gives you the other part of the story. He goes on to say that there are still others in verse 36. Still others had trials of mocking. Uh Uh-oh. 
Nothing supernatural going on. They're being mocked. They're being, they're being laughed at. They're being made fun of. Scourgings. They're beatings. Yes? And of chains and being put in jail. What are they being put in jail for? Because of their faith in God and God alone. Listen, your faith ought to get you in trouble. Come on now. Your faith ought to get you mocked by people who mock your God. See, we like that other part, vigilant in battles and, and raising of loved ones from the dead. We like that part. But sometimes your living faith will get you in trouble. It will get you mocked. It will get you skirted. It will get you beaten. It will get you put in jail. It, it will get you uh, uh, rejected by loved ones. Oh, I'm trying to give you some courage this morning. See, we want the Christian life to be all howdy duty. See, that guy down in Houston named Joel Osteen with that big old, he'll promise you all that. He ain't promised you this. And most of us will find ourselves in these situations more than we'll find ourselves in the other situations. They were stoned, verse 37, were sawn in two. How you like that? Living faith might get you stoned and sawn in two. And this is one of the problems. This is one of my pet peeves. We think too American about the Christian life. We don't think global. Because as we sit in this room, there are Christians in third world countries who are going through all this. Let Joe Osteen and all those wealth health and problems go over there and teach this to those people who are going through that. They ain't going there because they're going to get sawn in two. Only problem, there's no rescue by Jesus from them because they ain't real. That's why they don't go. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. People had their heads chopped off. Limbs chopped off. What is your living faith producing? What is your living faith getting you? And you don't have living faith if you don't have saving faith. And if you have saving faith, it ought to be evidenced by living faith. Now all I got to do is look at my Bible and look at you. All you got to do is look at, your, look at your Bible and look at me. I'm either getting delivered. I'm either getting rescued. I'm, I'm, I'm quitting the violence of fire because I'm being persecuted. Or I'm getting physically abused. All because of my faith in God or in Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't want that, you don't want the Christian life. And see, we live in America, and that's, and that's why you got to get out of America. That's why you got to read Fox's Book of Martyrs. That's why they got to read Tortured by Christ. You got to see what other people are going through. See, th this is not them not having enough money because of inflation. Uh oh. See, they're not suffering because gas prices are high. See, we think that's suffering. You ain't suffering. You're just being inconvenienced. And there's a difference. We can't even handle being inconvenienced. What makes us think we're going to be able to handle suffering for Christ's sake? You know, I, I really don't worry about prices. You know why I don't worry about prices? Because my God has said he will supply all my needs. My God told me in Matthew chapter 6, don't be anxious for nothing. And last time I checked, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, nothing means nothing. Not a thing. 
But Philippians chapter 4 says, rather than being anxious, rather than worrying, pray. Now, if I'm about my father's business, and I need food, clothing, and shelter to be about my father's business, and my father wants me to be about his business, I trust him enough to supply what I need to be about his business. Now, the problem for most people in church is they're not about his business, so they're not so sure he's going to supply. So what they do is they sell him out to go out and get it themselves. So I got to work on Wednesday night. Rather than coming to prayer meeting and Bible study, I got to work on Sunday. Rather than coming to church on Sunday, I got to... Because I don't believe God's going to supply. And guess what? I don't be, believe he's going to supply for you when you're on the world's agenda. Let the world take care of you. Not many of us in here take care of other people's kids. You know, God don't really has no real interest in taking care of Satan's kids. And if you're doing the agenda of Satan kids, you're right. You can't have much faith whether God's going to take care of you. But if you are on your father's business, if we are about the business of going into all the world and making disciples of all people groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, teaching them to observe all things and command them to do, in the power of the Holy Spirit, God is going to supply what you need. But it don't mean you won't suffer. Amen. It might get you in the lion's den. It might get your head chopped off. It might get you scourged and mocked, sawn in two. But that's what living faith does in spite of the consequences. Six minutes. There are multiplied victories here. And all of the people are not perfect people. But one thing that is undeniably clear and we know it's clear because it's God who put them on the list. That they have demonstrated that they have total faith in God and Jesus alone. And because of that total faith, and because they're growing and maturing in that and have not become stagnant and have not gone back to the elementary thing, God puts them on the list of great clouds of witnesses. I wonder this morning, just on those two points, is there enough evidence to say you're guilty of living by faith, verifying that you have been saved by faith? I wonder. It's a question we all need to ponder. And if you do that, I can guarantee you, based on the word of God, like these men's and women, you will have courage in stressful times. Not courage because you muster it up. Courage because the sovereign God of the universe has said, I have made promises to you, I have made provisions for you, and I have promised to be present with you no matter where you go. And therefore, that should give us confidence to stand boldly, to stand lovingly, to stand kindly, but to stand courageously no matter which way the winds of our culture are blowing. Amen? Father, we just thank you so much. We praise you. We honor you. May these truths be evident in our hearts. We look forward to next week when you finish this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Love your heart say, amen.